here we go. <laughs> Hello, ladies of Christian Women in the UK and Pearls of Grace Ministries. Um, it's Sidoni Ngum and Giselle here. We are going to be doing this hopefully in a two-part series, um, if not maybe more, depending on how the conversation goes. And we are going to be talking about giving um, in relation to our Christian walk, in relation to our fellow members within the body of Christ and our daily Christian living. Um, so I think we want to start off with, um, let's go with Giselle, giving. Oh, thank you, giving. <laughs> <laughs> it's, what it's, do you make of this sometimes difficult difficult conversation to have within the church well I think it's very important um, because giving is important and I've proved it's been proven to me I've proved it over the years that when you give it is given back to you but you've got to give with that heart that you're not expecting it to come back and you know, I've got a couple of wonderful testimonies of my own journey where people mm -hmm. have actually, you know, given to me. Um, but I'm also a strong believer that the, 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 the blessings, financial blessings that have come my way weren't actually due to the fact of me giving financially because years ago, uh, struggling financially, I, I did tithe my 10%, but more importantly, I tithed my time. I had a lot of time and I tithed time to go and sit and have a cup of tea with somebody in a chat, uh, volunteering at different things, going to the church and helping out, cleaning the toilets, making the tea, you know, being a, a greeter and all the rest of it. And so it's, it's not all about giving money. Churches we, and ministries, we all need money. But our time, I believe, is the most important thing that we can give to somebody. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. What do you make of it? I know you are, you're itching to go, go on, let's, let's have it. <laughs> I think it's really, really good to hear what you said, um, Giselle, because giving for me, I did not really come from a religious tradition which which really spoke about giving so much, being raised in the Catholic church. Okay, you give alms in church on Sunday. I remember coming across, I think it was, at the no, sorry. Okay. I remember coming across um, one of my parents, I think it was my dad, my dad's church contribution card. So the grew up in the Catholic church, so she might know this. Our parents used to have this contribution card, which I think they just gave a certain percentage of their income. It never was really like the 10% thing, so I grew up feeling like tithing was this Old Testament thing. It wasn't relevant to us. And so I was never really um, giving, you know, really, it wasn't a big thing for me. In fact, you know, as kids were taught to go and put money in the church basket, it was usually change, right? <laughs> so um, I think I carried on with that attitude when I grew up, I won't lie. But that was also because when I grew up now, I began to have my own ideas and I began to, you know, look at the church and I was like, man, the Catholic church is rich. They don't need my money. You know, so I was like, yeah, if I throw a pound in the basket, yeah, that's a, to me, that was a big deal because my thing was the church is already rich. Like, why am I giving them um, so much money? But in terms of giving in general, I think um, my mom taught me very much about giving. I was able to see that my mom did this thing where she used to take us to an orphanage in the local area. Um, talking of giving, we used to go and clean the church when we were kids. Um, and also um, just seeing my parents, how they related to family members who were in need. So as much as I wasn't directly giving to the church, my general notion of giving was quite good. I used, I, I thought it was a good thing to help people. So there was a point when I actually considered, you know, when I, you know, I dismissed the idea of tithing and I thought it was this terrible, I, I thought it was, you know, this thing that was irrelevant and oh, pastors were just using it to, you know, to just exploit people that's how I felt and you know Sidonia probably knows <laughs> I was quite vocal about that but um in a way I understood the sense of tithing I understood that the church needs money to run right mm. so there was a time when I actually thought okay I don't even go to church anymore but I would like the idea of taking 10% of my salary and just giving it to charity so yeah my my sense of giving was very very different until I began to I got saved and then I began to look at 
the Bible and really studied principles behind giving. And I'm still studying, so this is why I'm really interested to be here. Good. Good. That, that, that's very informative, isn't it, Sadonai? It is. I it like is, that. isn't it, Just? Yeah, 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 I mean, I like that. I mean, I'm, I'm probably the same. I grew up in the Catholic Church, so giving wasn't... Um, you know, like like Gum said, you had your contribution cards, your parents had their contribution cards, and then for the kids, they'll give them change, it was, and then you go put it in. So I grew up with that sense of, you know, it was just something you did every Sunday morning. Again, I think with the rise of the prosperity gospel, so my 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 journey to, to being born again is quite interesting. So I grew up in the church and I fell away because the Catholic church has its own issues, as we all know, mm -hmm. um, and it's very sort of legalistic and um, religious in its approach mm -hmm. now it does some things wonderfully good I mean I mean Goom, we laugh about this all the time it is brainwashing there's some prayers that we yeah. learn <laughs> at three that we can still say now yep. in our 30s and <laughs> our 40s so some things they do absolutely brilliantly but you know some of the doctrines are just not biblical yeah so I did come back into the faith um and fortunately unfortunately I came back during the rise of the prosperity gospel okay and that kind of made me think well hang on a minute when you just see what the bible says giving should be and what the tithe should be used for and what some of these um pastors and mega churches are using it for yeah. and then you look at the disparity between the ministers and the pastors who are meant to be servants Mm -hmm. of God because Christ says that you know let the highest among you be the least yes the highest among you should be willing to serve and so when you see that disparity you have pastors that have private jets for example yet you have members within the congregation who cannot afford three square meals a day exactly yeah and then you start to think do you really need, like a bit like, do you really need the tithe? Like, is it, is this going to your pocket or yep. are you using it to further the church? Um, and that again, you know, then I started thinking, well, it's not my place to judge. They'll be judged by God whenever they meet God the judge. However, there's just that fleshly thing. That's like, if I've got to give my 10%, I'm not going to give it to the church. I'm going to sponsor a child somewhere. I'm going to give it to a charity somewhere. I am going to give it to like an organization that I believe will make a difference with it, not line somebody else's pocket. Mm -hmm. I, I, again, I became conflicted because, you know, the, the Bible is clear that the tithe should be given to the storehouse. And your storehouse is where you're nourished because the storehouse is where people keep their grain. In the olden days, that's where you keep your grain. So when you need flour or food, you should go to your storehouse. Yes. You should give your tithe to where you're worshipping. Mm -hmm. um, but then you think, okay, there's the argument that that was in the Old Testament, wasn't it? In Malachi, a lot of these prosperity gospels kind of quote Malachi, um, you know, tithe and see whether I won't, I won't open up the windows of heavens and the, the floodgates of heavens with, and pour out blunt, abundant blessings on you and a lot of the prosperity pastors preach that and they use that verse Don't say, but yeah. then you yeah you flip over to the new testament and Christ says he's not come to abolish the law but to fulfill it yes and he tells us the story of the the, the widow who didn't have anything yeah our last mate, yeah. Yes, and all these rich people came and, you know, the tithing and she gives her might, which in comparison to the rich people's giving was literally everything. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So then it starts, Christ then starts questioning. I mean, he says this to the Pharisees as well. He says, you know, you hypocrites, you, you, you tithe up to 10% of your herbs and your cumin and, and your spices that you ignore the weightier matters of the law yeah which is you know love and you know when he's asked what is the most important commandment he says that you should love the lord your god with all your heart and then you should love your neighbor as yourself now if you are loving god with all your heart there's no way that you will not love his creation which is your neighbor as yourself mm -hmm. and if you're loving your neighbor as yourself then it shouldn't really matter what percentage you give to your neighbor as long as you're doing it with the right heart and as long as you're doing it with the right motive. So it then goes 
beyond the 10%. So 10%, this whole 10% thing to me is very legalistic because yes. you're loving your neighbor as you, as you should be loving yourself or as you love yourself. You won't give yourself 10% of everything you own. Nope. It goes beyond that. It might be 5%, but that 5% mm -hmm. you're giving, you're giving it willfully and without compulsion, mm -hmm. which is what Paul instructs us to do. Um, so it then takes it beyond the whole tithing argument for me personally. It now becomes a matter of the heart. Yes. Are you doing it out of love? Are you doing it um, not because you're being forced to, not because the law commanded you to give 10%. There might be some months where you give 50%. There might be some months where you give 1%. Mm -hmm. But where's that 1% coming from? And it's interesting because when we were talking earlier, I was telling you guys, I was reading... Um, something and, and second corinthians eight to nine i won't read the whole thing but it's just i don't know i've probably read this before um chapter eight and chapter nine feel free to read it when you get a, a chance but it's just been eye-opening so paul's writing um to the churches and if you just look at verse 13 of chapter eight he says our desire is not that others might be relieved while you are hard-pressed but that there might be equality. At the present time, your plenty will supply what they need, so that in truth, their plenty will supply what you need. The goal is equality, as it is written, the one who gathered much did not have too much, and the one who gathered little did not have too little. This is obviously Paul talking about collection. So again, this is New Testament, the church is being... Um, you know, established and the new, the new covenant has been established. And, you know, the subtitle here is co the collection for the Lord's people. So obviously he's instructing the church in Corinth um, and how to help the churches in, in Macedonia. Um, but it's, it's interesting because he's saying here that the, the goal is equality. He's saying he, he, the, the desire is not that. Others might be relieved while you die in poverty. Yeah. And if we're to take that to mean, don't tithe your 10% if that means you're not then going to be able to pay your rent. Yeah, exactly. Our desire like, is not that others might be relieved while you're hard pressed, but that yeah. there might be equality. And in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, doesn't Paul mm. also say you must decide in your own heart how much to give? Oh so, my God, lady! So, so that throws the ten percent out of the water, really, doesn't it? Doesn't it, uh, just? You know, uh, like as you say, if you can only give one percent, if you give it with all your right heart. attitude, the right meaning, and the right, mm. yeah, it's 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 better than somebody giving fifty percent with a mm. grudgingly attitude, isn't it? It is. Yeah. And you made a good point. You made a good point earlier, Giselle. You said you found that that tithing your time. Um, seem to be a lot more important than, than financial tithing. Yep. In this age. That, that's, that's one thing I think a lot of people misunderstand. Now, when people talk about giving, because of the prosperity gospel and the way the churches have taken it, a lot of people automatically shut down and the blinkers come down because they think, oh, they want my money. Yep. That's yeah. It's not your money. It, yeah. It's time, um, resources, your time, your resources, which is your money and your talent. Mm -hmm. These are the three main areas of giving. Mm -hmm. Very, the resources, very. Your money is just a third of it. Very much so. Yeah. Your talent and your time are things that cannot be replicated. Money wow. can. I can give a hundred pounds a month. You can give a hundred pounds a month. Gum can mm -hmm. give a hundred pounds a month. Money can be replicated within the body of Christ, mm -hmm. but your time. Mm -hmm. And your talent cannot be replicated by anybody else. And that's right. the unique set of skills that only you bring to the body of Christ. And so if you're able to tithe of that, your, your talent and your time, mm -hmm. that is something that nobody else can offer your 10 minutes in God's service or your one hour a week in God's service. Exactly. Nobody else but you. Exactly. And so I think that's a really good point. Let's maybe try and as Christians, move away from this whole money is important, yes, and the world needs money to run, we need to buy things. Yeah. You know, like, like, like we said at the, at the start of this, churches 
buildings need money for upkeep, for uh, uh, utilities and all the rest of it. Mm. Uh, but money's not the be all and end all. No. It, it, it yeah. really isn't. And especially when we're uh, coming up uh, through this sort of, we're, we're still sort of in some places in lockdowns and everything like that. Uh, mm. There's a lot of people that are so lonely they don't maybe see somebody from one mm -hmm. week to the next. And what a lovely way if you could even just go to their window or their front door and speak with them, even send them a text message. Take a few amazing? minutes, few few minutes out of your busy day just to send them a text message. Or here in my bookcase behind me, I've got a little box of different cards. And uh, every now and again, God will lend my heart and uh, one of my neighbours, and I'll write a wee note, just checking that you're okay. Hope everything is well. And I dropped my phone number onto it. Just this my number in case you've forgotten it. If you need anything, let me know. And I will drop it through their letterbox. Um, mm. that lets and me Christ said, whatever you do for the least of, of my brothers, you do unto me. Exactly. So sitting there and, and having a cup of tea with someone who's in a hospice because they've only, you know, they've only got months to live. That will go a lot further than giving them hundred pounds a week exactly Don't time, that more. Yeah. yeah time is so important it really is it and is. A, it and is. A week and we can give some time to people i believe it's the best thing i really do yeah and it's interesting because like for example in my church we don't do offering we don't we don't collect an offering mm -hmm. and i've always found that a bit you know like why don't you collect an offering you know surely we're instructed to come to the lord with you know with our gifts and present them to the lord and it's you know throughout the whole testament throughout throughout old testament you know you're not you're not to come before the lord empty-handed however in first corinthians 16 um paul writes this is it's titled the collection for the lord's people which is again the whole idea of you know giving and offering and tithing and whatever and paul writes now the collection for the lord's people do what I told the Galatian churches to do. On the first day of every week, each one of you should set aside a sum of money in keeping with your income, saving it up so that when I come, no collections will have to be made. So when he comes to do a church service, no collections will have to be made. Yep. Then when I arrive, I will give letters of introductions to the men you approve and send them with your gifts to Jerusalem. If it, is, if it seems advisable for me to do so, they will accompany me. Yes. Isn't that amazing? So he's telling them before he even goes there to do a church service, he's saying to them, set aside your offering, because when I come there, I won't do an offering during the service. When we're having our you know, church group, this is exactly what I said to the churches in Galatia. You know, he's, he's saying to the church in Corinth before he gets there, he's telling them, this is what I did to the churches in Galatia. Before I get to you and do a church service, mm -hmm. on the first day of every week, each one of you should set aside a sum of money. Because when I come there to Corinth, he's telling the Corinthians, when I come over to Corinth to do a church service, I won't make any collections. Nope. No collections will be made whilst I'm there. Instead, I'll put aside all the money that you've collected and I'll send it as your gift to Jerusalem. And isn't that an interesting concept? It's that thing where you were saying earlier, isn't it? Each man should decide in his heart what he what he can and what he wants to give yes mm -hmm. and, and then in second corinthians again he's obviously telling them that the, the goal is not that we'll relieve some people and make you hard pressed mm -hmm. the goal is that there should be equality and, and and i think isn't that what god wants for all of us that your brother shouldn't suffer whilst you languish or, or something like your brother shouldn't languish in poverty whilst you just live in riches and, and refuse to share some of the blessings that you've been given. Uh, I mean, can I just say yeah. um, that particular bit touched me a lot because when you look at one of my problems with the, pro, the, the whole prosperity gospel slash Protestant work ethic, if you like, is that sometimes I used to listen to evangelicals and, you know, you follow America. And there can be a lot of ideology around giving or around how people should relate to each other. And people will always claim that it's their Christian background, right? That informs that. 
And it's very interesting for you to tell me here that the goal should really be equality. Yet you will have American evangelicals who will tell you that no, you know, they don't see anything that involves sharing with your brother is socialism. Americans hit this word with a passion, right? But when you really look at it, I'm thinking, hello, you don't see that somebody should have health care, right? Because it's socialism. But you are telling me here, Sidoni, that the word of God is very clear. If you have a lot and somebody doesn't have much, and it's true, there's a host of reasons why somebody may not have much. I'm not the one to be endorsing laziness. If people are lazy, what they don't need is your money. Yeah. What they need is your motivation, right? But it just speaks to me as to as to what giving should be, because I think that sometimes when we talk about giving, and this has been something that I've, I've struggled with, with a lot of churches, it's fine. Like we've all established here, the church needs to turn on the lights and everything, right? That's a very pragmatic. Even before I was sick, I was like, can we just call this thing a tax and let's all be happy? You know, because to me, it's practical. Even when I wasn't giving alms in church, right? I used to go to the Catholic church now, put money in the little boxes for candles and flowers because I'm like I like it when the church looks nice let me pay for the flowers I like I come here and I use candles let me pay for them so I have that kind of practical mind but I think one of the things that we also don't hear enough of is helping one another because like you said here the giving has been in different categories and I think Paul emphasized a lot on helping each other the collections were always for some person or another. We're not really hearing of Paul himself taking a lot of money or Peter or whatever. So mm. I think that there's, there's a kind of disconnect between the church now and the early church in that a lot of the focus, the giving now seems to be focused on, yes, you give your tithe and whatever, but do people even really know where that money goes? Because that's another issue I have. I just don't see enough transparency in a lot of church settings that I've come across. Yeah, mm. exactly. It's like uh, Sadoni said earlier that uh, instead of giving to church, you used to give to a charity. Now, mm. I have stopped donating to large charities because mm -hmm. when their mm -hmm. CEOs are getting an excess of £120,000 a year salary. Exactly. No, that's not that's your money. That's I know what I mean. Yeah, that I, is I really wrong. Money. I don't want to get yeah. sued, but there are people who will never see my money. <laughs> yeah, ex exactly. So, so I, I would much rather give to local charities or food banks and things like that, where you know the money is actually going to help people. Mm -hmm. um, but no, not not to a big charity, because that's a business. That's money making business. Mm -hmm. It is. Mm -hmm. yeah. it's, all, it's all very interesting, isn't it? Uh, it is. And I think we just need to go back to it's like everything. And it's funny because Christ came, so before Christ came, I believe, God revealed his, his heart to the Old Testament um, Israelite. And he did that through the Ten Commandments, through the patriarchs, through, um, you know, the judges, through the prophets, through all the books in the Old Testament, God revealed his heart for us through yes. them. But he also revealed in the Old Testament at the fundamental problem with human beings from Adam or from Eve to Adam to present day is our heart. Yes, very much so. The Old Testament just points clearly to the fact that what's wrong with mankind is our heart. Yes. And so the New Testament comes to deal with that problem. Mm -hmm. It comes to deal with the heart problem. It doesn't come to deal with the law because Christ said it. Christ says he didn't come to abolish the law. We need the law. You know, there's, there's no lawless land. We need the law. We need guidance. We need morals. We need code of ethics. We need the law. Christ didn't come to, to abolish the law. But it is clear that we cannot, just by the pure sinful nature of our heart, we cannot live up to any letter of the law exactly I agree. clearly that yeah. our righteousness is like filthy rags before him i agree wholeheartedly um, so christ comes to deal with our hearts mm -hmm. and so the new testament focuses on the heart the new covenant focuses on the heart that there might be a transformation mm -hmm. renewal within us and that our hearts might be transformed to be more and more like christ that the same mind that was in christ should be in us exactly and, and and Christ was a, was, a, was a man of heart and compassion, wasn't he? Brilliant. Yep. 
very very much so i'm sorry mm -hmm. ladies but uh we're less than a minute this is going to cut off very soon uh okay. maybe we should leave it there should we and we can do part two we'll come back we'll come back